We ask for you to lead and guide those who care for him. Make sure they know his every need. And we ask for you to come send your spirit blowing through us that while our hearts may be concerned about David, you know our need to worship you. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Make your presence known to us that we might be ready to worship you no matter what is going on around us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. If you are visiting with us, there are pew cards in the pew slots. Those have the front side is an opportunity for visitors to share your contact information. Um, the back side is a prayer request. So I invite you to fill those out, put them in the offering plate, and I will see them on Monday morning. We have a few other announcements, but listen to the opportunities that we have. We have some great opportunities coming up this summer, and I hope you will find a way to be part of them. Brown, if you don't know me, I'm just an old wore out drunk who's been redeemed by Jesus Christ, given second chances and a restored life, and I'm thankful. We want you to plan to join Pastor Laurel at Lemonade with Laura on Tuesday, June 21st at 10 a.m., and at 6.30 p.m. There's a lot of people who keep saying we lack communication in the church. Well, this is a chance to get communication one-on-one, -on -one, and you should take advantage of it. It's to your benefit. Bring your facts and bring your emotions with you. She don't care. Just come. Just come and talk and find out what's going on in the church that you think you don't know. That's a good time for that. Vacation Bible School has been established. I think there's a meeting this week, and I'm not sure what the date is. Anybody know? Thursday at 11 o'clock, there will be a meeting about Vacation Bible School. Are there any announcements from the congregation? If not, stand and greet each other, please.
Please stand as you're able. Our call to worship. We come, God. We come unsure where to seek God's presence. The wind blows, but God is not in the wind. The earth quakes, but God is not in the earthquake. The fire burns, but God is not in the fire. There is nothing but utter silence. God is in the silence. In silence, we will wait for God. God is with us now. Our opening hymn is God of the Spira, God of the Whale. may be seated. Let's pray before we pray, if you don't mind. You mind? Lord? She don't care. Let's pray. Let's, let's go to God. We hadn't done this in a long time. Heavenly Father, let your spirit prevail this morning in each of our hearts in each of our lives. Holy God, we come before you and we've done it again, Lord. We failed. But we come in this sanctuary to worship the one triune God and his son, Jesus Christ, who we know has died, bled for our sins and risen to let us know that one day we will be in an eternity with him forever. God, we thank you for being a God of second chances, and we thank you for being a God of restoration. Only you can do that, Lord. And you've demonstrated in our lives time and time again that if we allow it and if we trust you, 
you will get us through and everything will be reconciled, especially to you. Dear God, we're thankful. Lord, we lift up this church this morning, the congregation present and the congregation not here. We're in a process of going through some decision making in the life of this church and we would simply ask, dear God, that with the leaders of the church and with the congregation as a whole, that your Holy Spirit would prevail in each heart so that we can make the correct decisions affecting this church. That's all we ask, Lord, for your will to be done, not ours. Dear God, we thank you for the country that we live in. Even under turmoil, Lord, we know that your hand is upon us and we're grateful. We know that somehow through all that's going on, you, oh God, will be recognized as the one who provides, the one who saves, the one who restores, and the one who heals. Dear God, thank you for being in the life of this church. Thank you for our families and grandkids and all the people, friends around us, Lord. You bless us every day, Lord, and we take it for granted. We confess it, and we're sorry. That's why we're here, Lord, because it's you. It's not us, and we're thankful. And now, if you will, would you pray? Come, O oh God, be with us here. As much as a deer longs for the streams of cool water, we long to know that you are with us. When trouble and sorrow come, we need you. Help us remember that you are always with us and that your love is steadfast. Put your song into our hearts that we may praise you this day. Amen. Almighty God, when your people shifted their focus from you to idols, you sent prophets with your word in order to call them back to you. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son to be the living word for our salvation. Today, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit so that as the scripture is read, the word is proclaimed, we might be transformed. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from 1 Kings. I'm sorry, we skipped special music. We will read the scripture shortly. <laughs>
You may remain seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a message to Elijah with this message. May the gods do whatever they want to to me if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like the life of one of them. Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went further on to the desert a day's journey. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He longed for his own death. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. He lay down and slept under the solitary broom bush. Then suddenly... <clears throat> A messenger tapped him and said to him, Get up, eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flatbed break, baked on glowing coals and a jar of water right by his head. He ate and drank and then went back to sleep. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something because you have a difficult road ahead of you. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and went refreshed by that food for 40 days and nights until he arrived at Oreb, God's mountain. There he went into a cave and spent the night. The Lord's word came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I am the only one left and now they want to take my life too. The Lord said, Go out and stand at the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is passing by. A very strong wind tore through the mountains and broke apart the stones before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire, there was a sound thin, quiet. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his coat. He went out and stood at the cave entrance, and a voice came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? He said, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars, and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they want to take my life too. The Lord said to him, Go back through the desert to Damascus, and I know it, Haziel, as king of Aram. Woo, this is a good story. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. we end up missing out but getting focused only on God being there in the silence. What we miss is that God is present throughout this story. 
and God is walking with Elijah. We all know those people who walk with us. I'm fortunate on Father's Day to be able to say my father was one of those people who would walk with me no matter what. Good times and bad times. Dad was there. Whether it was learning to swim and him being in the pool ready to catch me, whether it was teaching me to ride a bicycle, or in high school when I was so busy I didn't think it was necessary to eat lunch, and I certainly didn't want what was being served in the cafeteria, and I usually had a ball game after school, it wasn't unusual for Dad to catch me before we left with a cheeseburger from the restaurant that was just around the corner from school. Dad made sure I was ready for whatever journey and he was there when I got home, usually standing there waiting to know, do you want an egg, an omelet, or a grilled cheese when I got back in late? Dad was there ready to help sustain me. But Dad also never let us settle. He was always encouraging us to take that next step, to keep growing. Whether it was math games or something else, he was challenging our minds. He was encouraging us to grow, and he was usually setting an example of what it meant to be a faithful, kind, caring human being. So I come thankful today for a father who showed me that image. But that's the image of God in this passage. God who cares for Elijah and knows exactly where Elijah is. He doesn't condemn him. He does challenge him. He asks him, why are you here? Or in other translations, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, I've been very passionate. I've done everything I was supposed to do. And now I'm all alone. And I'm scared. Just let me die. God feeds Elijah and sends him on a journey. A journey to encounter God in a holy place. But in the midst of that holy place, Elijah doesn't hear God in the noise of the earthquake or the fire or the wind. Elijah has to listen carefully to tune himself in to hear God. And when he does hear God, he remembers Moses and he covers his face and he steps out. It's a leap of faith to step out and trust that he can enter, encounter the living God. That's why he covers his face. And again, God asks him, Why are you here? Why are you here, Elijah? Elijah repeats that he's been very passionate for God. But now he's all alone and he's scared and he just like like to be left alone. Sometimes we get the same way. We think we've done what we need to do for God. I've been very passionate, God. We've done all of this. And we rattle off the list. Let us be comfortable now, God. Let us just be comfortable. God rarely says, stay put and be comfortable. 
You see, what God does for Elijah is Elijah is sent back off with purpose again. Elijah had been used by God to raise the widow's son from the dead. He had won the showdown with the prophets of Baal, but he forgot that, yes, there were others that had been saved for this purpose, that God would not leave them behind. And he forgot that God is the one that went with him. So instead of boldly following God, he turned and ran to the desert to hide. Afraid of what he knew God could defeat. Sometimes it doesn't seem like Elijah is off for comfort when he heads into the desert to curl up under a broom bush. But what Elijah is saying is in that moment is, I'm tired and I don't want to do this anymore, God. I'm not sure what the next step is. So God directs him. Here's your next step. Turn around and go back the way you came. You still have work to do. This week I was talking to our district superintendent, Reverend Telly Gadson, also known as Pastor T. And she reminded me of something that the bishop had to say a couple of years ago and he used it almost every gathering a couple of years ago. I don't know if you heard it. He declared that God created the church not for our pleasure, but for God's purposes. God created the church not for our pleasure, but for God's purposes. Maybe it sounds like God created the church not to make me comfortable, but to give me purpose. God created the church to give me a community where I didn't have to be worried about being alone when I try to live out God's purposes. We are in the season of annual conferences and I have a friend who's in the Western North Carolina Conference. She has had a long and difficult journey to ordination. But last night, she was ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church. And there were pictures of her glowing with excitement and energy with a crowd of people who had been walking with her joyfully celebrating what God had been at work doing. She could have easily said long ago, it's not worth the hard work. It's not worth the toil. It's not worth the disappointment. It's certainly not worth having to endure watching a church close, which she did this year. but she is looking forward to the next step. A new part-time appointment at a new Methodist church, one that is excited about doing new things. I wish I had a chance to sit down and listen to her because even in her Facebook post, you can catch the excitement The excitement doesn't come from reward. It comes from purpose. We all need purpose. God has called each of us to be in ministry with God in the mission of reconciling all things back to God.
Elijah declared that everything in the world was wrong. But God still had work for him to do. We look around and we say, everything is wrong in the world. The next generation isn't right. The older generation isn't right. My generation isn't right. All that's on the news is bad news. And we are tempted to be like Elijah and say, I'm burnt out, I'm tired, I've had enough. God's response is travel with me. Travel with me, be renewed, but I am going to give you purpose. And in that purpose you will find life. Elijah is an amazing character. From starving in the desert to relying on the widow to seeing God at work making a small jar of oil and a small amount of flour last through the drought to defeating the prophets of Baal to watching the rains come to end the drought. to seeing the world not be exactly like he thought it would be when he finished that task. And God said, go back the way you came. Go back into the fight. Go live this out, Elijah. You still have work to do. So often we want to sit on what we have done. I've been very passionate for God. Look at what we've accomplished. And God says, I'm doing something new. I am continuing to bring life out of death. We still couldn't see it after the prophets. After God returning the people, his people back to their home after exile, we still didn't get that God is all about bringing new life forth. And so he sent Jesus Christ to us who showed us a different way to live a way that was filled with life-giving love, a way that was filled with not an easy path. Remember, God told Elijah there was a difficult path ahead. Jesus walked the most difficult path of all. He walked to the cross to die for our sins that we might know God's love and faithfulness to us. Even after dying on the cross, Jesus wasn't finished. There was more to be done. He was raised from the dead and he came back to his disciples and told them that there was more to be done. You have purpose. You are to carry my word and my love out into the world. God says the same to us. Jesus declares to us, I have given you new life. I have set you free from sin and death so that you might live with purpose, the purpose of sharing my love with the world. As the church, we're challenged to decide who we are. 
Are we Elijah hiding under a broom bush, having lost sight of God's purpose for us? Or are we the disciples of Jesus who hear the risen Savior say, Go, make disciples of all the world, training them in what I have taught you. As United Methodists, our mission statement is to make disciples. But we've added on the phrase for the transformation of the world. It's important for us to realize that that's what this is all about. It's not make disciples for their own comfort or for my comfort. Not to just simply enjoy the church, but to be the church. Living out God's call in community. Knowing that the church was not created for our pleasure, but for God's purpose of reconciling all things back to God. God's with us in the silence. God's with us in the noise. God's with us on what seems like long and difficult journeys. Ready to feed us when we're too worn out to take the next step. Thanks be to God. As children of the living God, with one heart, one voice, and one faith, let us proclaim that, we, that which we believe 
using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come with all kinds of concerns. Concerns that are personal in nature, concerns about the world around us, concerns about the church itself. But we come knowing that we turn to a God who hears our prayers and who acts to continue working to reconcile all of the world back to God. A God that cares about the whole world and also cares about what weighs on our hearts. And so I invite you, as a way of lifting your own personal concerns, to raise your hand. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we have the ability to become fatigued by compassion, to become fatigued of doing good work, yet we find our rest and our comfort and our strength in you. So when we look around at the world and say that things seem as hopeless as Elijah thought they were, remind us that nothing is hopeless, for you are at work in our midst, bringing new life out of that which is dying away. In a world where we see natural disasters, floods that rip away homes, and heat that crushes us, you are present. In a world that is filled with arguments over political structures and wars, you are the one who offers peace and encourages us to let it begin with us. That peace begins when we allow you to be at work in our lives, for you to show us how we are to live, what we are to do. So we pray for you to open our hearts that we might discern who you are calling us to be, what you are calling us to do. Grant us grace that we may be people who live faithfully and boldly into what you are calling us to do. Sometimes the world is a scary place. Sometimes we're just tired. Another phone call, 
another sick friend. Another day and more rising prices and uncertain bank accounts. Another day and more work to be done. Another day for some eking out mere subsistence. But you promise us so much more. You don't always feed us with bread baked on glowing coals right at our head. But you feed us with your word. And you give us water that quenches our thirst. Living water meant to give us life in the midst of the worst of times. Water that we long for as the deer longs for fresh water. We come to you trusting you. And looking to you to guide us. Guide us in ways that we ask when we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each time we prepare to off make our offering, we acknowledge that there are many ways in which we give of ourselves to God. Sometimes it's giving up something that's important to us. I want to thank Dick Davis for showing up today on short notice. He gave up his vacation to come try to help us here today. There's somebody who's given something up for you all the time. For me, it was frequently my dad. For you, there are people who have given up something for you. They have given sacrificially. We have all been given the gift of new and abundant life through Christ's sacrifice of his own life for us. So not only are we called to give of our money, whether it's in the plate or whether it's online, whether it's sending a check in, whether it's change in a baby bottle, we are also called to give of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. So I invite you in this time of offering not just to put money in a plate, but offer yourself to live out God's purposes.
before you on this Father's Day, giving thanks for the faith of our fathers, those people who have gone before us, who have loved us and taught us your ways. We ask your blessings upon those who have struggled to be fathers, not quite knowing how to live that out. But we come today acknowledging that you are all of our fathers. Of all of us, you are our father. And we are your beloved children who give thanks and ask you to use the gifts you have given us and that we return to you that others might know your grace, your glory, and your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I have learned that when Mark Cox comes around and looks at me through this doorway over here that it's usually worth letting him come out here and say something because he usually has something important to say. Doggone it guys, I'm excited. 
Aldersgate has a passion running through it and an excitement running through it that I've not seen in a very long time. I've talked with members of this congregation who eloquently express their concerns about the future and the potential of the church. I've heard excitement from those who are saying, gosh, what, what a wonderful possibility. It's endless. What, what can Aldersgate do next? There's a group of people, and some of them are here right now. There's a group of people that had the energy and the foresight to say, we're going to start a church in the west of Sumter. They're here now. That same energetic, that's chapter one, that same energetic group said, we're going to build a fellowship hall. And they built it. That same, that's chapter two, the same energetic group of people said, we're going to build a fellowship hall. And they built it. Guys, I don't know what Aldersgate's next chapter is, but I want to be a part of it. And I, I, think, there, I think there's passion on both sides. And I pray that we all listen and embrace each other and decide what's best for Aldersgate. But more than anything, I just want to say there is excitement here. So let's all embrace that too. Thank you for giving me a minute of your time. Amen. May we go forth. Fathers, happy Father's Day. May you have a restful afternoon filled with the things that you love. May we go forth as those who God feeds, who God talks to, and who God sends out with purpose. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.